Hi, everybody. Welcome to the SAG After Foundations, the business program, an introduction to mindful awareness. I'm Janani Subramanian, Associate Director of Programs at the Foundation. Now, without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Diana Winston, Director of Mindfulness Education at UCLA's Mindful Awareness Research Center. I'm so happy to be here. Um, it's really, it's great to be able to offer this program to all of you. And I'm just, here we are, getting set up here. Good. So I am the Director of Mindfulness Education at UCLA's Mindful Awareness Research Center. And I've been teaching mindfulness for you know about the last 20 years. And I teach it in a whole variety of settings. And um, what I, I'm really excited to do this particular one because when I was young, I wanted to be an actor and I tried and I did not succeed. <laughs> But I went on to have a different career in the world of mindfulness, but I think I remember the territory pretty well. So just happy to offer this to you. Um, I'm going to share some slides so we can get a sense of what mindfulness is. And this is really about this introduction to mindfulness for reducing stress and increasing well-being in challenging times. So we're all on the same page. I'll start with the definition. I define it as paying attention to present moment experiences with openness, curiosity, and a willingness to be with that experience. So it's really about how can we stay in the present moment, not lost in the past or the future. And this is an interesting process and a practice that we all can, um, can develop. So mindfulness has its roots in the ancient uh, Buddhist traditions, and it comes to us over, it's over thousands of years, and it's now being done in all over, in corporate settings, in educational settings. Um, I even saw, remember this, I don't know if anyone saw that particular episode. Um, mindfulness, you can see it in the business, workplace, K through 12 education, higher education, it's showing up in creativity in the arts as it is right in this moment, with first responders, mental health, healthcare, and so many other settings. And really, it's just, it's as creative as people are who are practitioners of mindfulness, they're spreading it into their um, their sectors and working with the communities that they're most um, most passionate about. For instance, this is a this is a slide where a school in Brooklyn, I believe, turned a room that was unused into a meditation space for the students where they could come and use it whenever they want. So it's really just I've just seen this enormous growth over 30 years, my own personal practice of mindfulness since the late 80s. It's just quite incredible. So mindfulness for you has a lot of possibilities. It could reduce stress and anxiety. And I know that your field is it has a lot of anxiety behind it. I um, also, of course, have a lot of friends in um, the same field. And I also, I just want to acknowledge that we are living in a time of enormous stress and anxiety. So if you are feeling stressed out, it is appropriate. So not only is your job perhaps stressing you out or looking for work, or, um, but this world is a time of enormous stress and anxiety. So it's very normal if you're having stress responses. And so we need tools that can help us during this time and, and for life. So but there are benefits in terms of improving attention, cultivating self-awareness and self-regulation, meaning emotional balance, helping improve relationships, and it's a helpful self-care tool. And so as I talk today, I'm going to talk for the next little bit about some of the science behind it, behind mindfulness and why it could be helpful to you. And then we'll do some practice and we'll see what it's like. And some of you may already have a mindfulness practice. This may be a bit of a review for some of you. And then we can talk specifically about how we might apply it in situations in your life where you where it would be useful. Um, I've already gotten some questions about how do you apply it to preparing for a role? Um, so we can look at that as we move on this afternoon. So let's talk about the mindfulness and health research. There's a lot of research showing that mindfulness is helpful with things like cro chronic pain, insomnia, cardiovascular health. It's helpful for mental health issues like anxiety, dep depression. It impacts attention. So let's look a little more closely at this. 
So the research is still fairly young. I mean, there has been research going on for the past, say, 20 years, looking at the impact of mindfulness on um, health, physical health, mental health. But it's still, there's so much more to do. And it's it's very exciting. There's a lot of positive results, but it's still in the early phase, I would say. Mindfulness is shown to be to positively impact genetic markers of inflammation. So if inflammation, which is the body's response to stress, when it's unchecked over time can lead in the long term to these types of diseases. And the research around mindfulness and they were looking at the genetic markers and they saw they were positively impacted by by meditation and mindfulness, such that it can help uh, ward off, prevent, or at least, you know, contribute to, uh, contribute to these not, not, um, not becoming chronic illnesses. So hold on. Um, give me one sec. Okay. Here we go. So when we think about the immune response, when we're under stress, we have a cortisol, the cor our cortisol levels go up, we have an inflammatory response, and our immune system gets depressed. But with meditation practices, the cortisol level is decreased, the inflammatory response also is decreased, and the immune system is boosted. So this is an example of a study that happened quite a long time ago, but really interesting study. And this is about people with psoriasis. Psoriasis, as you may know, is that itchy skin condition. The typical treatment is, uh, like you see in the image, UVB tanning rays, like UVB tanning, but UVB rays on the skin. And um, what some people did is they listened to an audio and practiced meditation while they were getting the treatment. And those people, their skin cleared up twice as fast as the people who didn't listen to the audio. So this study shows a lot about the mind-body connection and the ways in which stress impact our physical symptoms and how we might be able to use uh, these practices, these mind-related, heart-related techniques to impact our physical body. Mindfulness is also helpful for mental health. So anxiety, depression, whether or not you have, let's say, a diagnosis of anxiety or depression, or you have the normal anxiety and depression that I was talking about earlier that we're all struggling with these days, mindfulness is shown to be helpful. It's so helpful that it's been incorporated into a variety of treatments like mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, acceptance and commitment therapy. And these are for one, the first one's for depression. The second one has, what used to be primarily for anxiety. Both of these have kind of expanded and dialectical behavioral therapy for borderline personality disorder, but also now being used in an expanded way. So some examples of why we might think about how mindfulness is helpful for mental health. This was a study done where there were about 2,500 people who were buzzed on their smartphones and they were all around the world and they were asked three questions. The first question was, what were you doing? What are you doing? Is your mind on it? And how's your mood? So they were asked these questions just randomly in the middle of the day, didn't know what they were doing, didn't really matter. They just wanted to know what was happening related to these three questions. What they discovered, the first thing they discovered is 49.6% of the time we are not in the present moment. So about half the time we're somewhere else, we're not in the present moment. So the question might be, where are we? Um, when they looked more specifically about where we were, we go into three different areas unpleasant, neutral, or pleasant thoughts. So this scale, if you can look at the scale, what you'll see is this on this side is, is sad, and this side is happy. If you're lost in thought about a third of the time and you're thinking pleasant things, you'll report being happy. So let's say you're, you're I don't know, thinking about a great meal that you had the other day. You're still happy, but you're not in the present moment. That's okay. But two thirds of the time, you're thinking about things that are either neutral or unpleasant. And then people report it, as you can see, the most unhappiness. However, when people who were in the present moment reported that their mind was on what they were doing, that they're in the present moment, they reported being happier. And they reported being happy even if they were doing things they didn't like. So let's say you don't like to wash the dishes, but 
you and if you wash the dishes thinking about an upcoming role and how nervous you are, mm, you're going to be not too happy. But if you stay in the present moment, notice your hands as you wash the dishes, the feel of the water, the weight of the dishes, you will report more happiness, at least according to this study. Mindfulness can also improve attention. So this was something we did uh, years ago where we looked at adults and adolescents who had attention deficit disorder, ADHD. And what we found when we put them through an eight week protocol, learning mindfulness over the course of these eight weeks is that they had improved symptoms of ADD. Okay, so what I mean by that is there's lots of ways in which attention functions right in ways in which there are different types of attention and the scientists have looked at different ways that attention works so one of the ways is is something called conflict attention conflict attention is if you have multiple things competing for your attention what happens to your attention and so if you're let's say i'm asking you to focus on my hand but this hand is distracting you it's hard to stay focused if you have ADHD, it's very hard to stay focused. And that's why a child who has ADD is trying to focus on the teacher, but the ability to stay focused isn't as developed as, it, it, it's just not as, as strong. So they'll get lost, right? They'll get lost um, and they won't pay attention. And then, you know, we know what that can lead to. If you, most of our lives, you were probably told to pay attention, right? We're told as kids in school, we, if you have kids, you tell your children, your grandchildren, pay attention, pay attention, pay attention. But people don't typically tell you how to pay attention. What happened in this study is we taught people how to focus. So when their attention wandered, you bring it back to the present moment. I'm going to teach you the same thing in a little bit. Attention wandered, bringing it back, bringing it back. And that changed their ability to pay attention, particularly this conflict attention that I was describing, right? That's hard to do. Another study that was done looking at the brains of long term meditators. So these are people who have been meditating for like 30, 40 years in caves in the Himalayas, for instance, and they compared it to brains of people their same age range. And what they discovered is that there are certain areas and the areas are here on the slide, the insula cortex and the prefrontal cortex, which are different than people of the same age range. So what's happening is as you age, your brain thins out. I don't know if you know that. If you want something else to worry about, that is it. Our brain is thinning as we age. But in the advanced meditators, that's not what's happening. So if you look at this, um, the blue, the blue dots are the meditators, the red dots are the controls. The prefrontal cortex is a little bit, it's more interesting in a certain way because you can see the way the prefrontal cortex, this is age, this is thickness. It gets very thin as, the, as people age out, but not with the meditators. It stays pretty, um, pretty robust. The prefrontal cortex is something we want to have a lot of gray matter. The prefrontal cortex is what we think of as the CEO of our brain. It's responsible for executive functioning, delayed gratification, flexible thinking, working memory. All of these things are, are uh, correlated to that part of the brain. So this so the in the advanced meditators it wasn't shrinking but you've heard this study and maybe some of you have never done mindfulness before maybe some of you had and you're thinking so what but they've actually looked at it with novice meditators people who started with zero background and practice on average of 27 minutes a day over eight weeks and found gray matter changes in minute but changes in similar parts of the brain so this is really good news that we can actually change our brain you may be familiar with the concept of neuroplasticity, right? The idea that you're not stuck with what you've got. Our brain changes as we new, well, let's say new neural pathways get developed over time, depending on what we do with the brain and old ones get pruned. So if you do want to develop your attention or you want to develop your memory or you want, I mean, a memory is more complicated because there's a lot of factors involved, but things can change over time. Our brains have a kind of plasticity. They used to think brains stopped developing after the age of 25, which is absolutely untrue. 
Last study I'll mention was something we did at UCLA where we looked at um, uh, how mindfulness might impact altruism. And so this was a study where people did it. It was a, it was a video game and you had to donate um, money to different people. And so people met, were t just, it was a very simple study. They learned a basic meditation and then they evaluated, did it make people more generous? And in this particular study, which we did about a year and a half ago, mindfulness group donated at 2.61 times the control group. So one thing to understand about scientific studies is doing it once is not enough. It has to be repeated. It has to have larger sample sizes. There's a lot more to do. And yet it's very interesting, right? We can learn a lot and we can, um, and it can help us to feel, oh, wow, this might be something I want to try, perhaps. And we'll talk more about that. And this is just, I won't go over this, but these are studies we've done at UCLA, including an insomnia study, studies with breast cancer survivors, with Alzheimer's caregivers, and uh, so on. Okay, so let's go back to mindfulness. Mindfulness is paying attention to present moment experiences with openness, curiosity, and a willingness to be with that experience. How does it work? It keeps our mind from being lost in the past or the future. So we talked about that a little bit earlier, but much of the time, if you're checking to your mind at any point of the day, you're thinking about something that happened in the past, replaying it, why did I do that? Why did I say that? Obsessing, stressing about it. Or you're thinking about something that's coming up, worrying, going into the worst case scenario. What if, what if, uh-oh, catastrophizing. Um, I don't know if this looks familiar to you, but it's familiar to many people. <laughs> Did I lock the door? Bills? Oh, is it something I, you know, anybody wake up in the middle of the night like this, worrying about things? The answer is probably yes, because it happens to most of us. Something I always tell students is don't believe everything you think in the middle of the night, because it's always distorted. Right? Don't you have that experience of the next day? You look back and you think, why was I so stressed about that? When you're sleepy, it impacts your perception. Let's just put it that way. So mindfulness is this invitation not to be lost in the future, like in the slide, not to be lost into the past, but come into the present moment where there's often a place of ease and peace. Mindfulness also counteracts automaticity. Automaticity is that sense of being on automatic pilot, like you're just, you're just on going through life and you're doing what you do. And at the end of the day, you have no idea what happens. You know, sometimes we experience that I ever get in the car, get out of the car and have no idea what happened in between. This is this automatic pilot. What people report with mindfulness is there is more sense of gratitude, appreciation, connection to life. This is very, it's wonderful when you start to feel like as you practice mindfulness, you're less like this, which I know is a silly slide, but it's just like, you know, sort of robotic, but, and more open to life and present. I had a physician who took one of my classes and he, he was completely new. And after a few weeks, he said, you know, I've lived on my street for 15 years and I never knew there were mountains at the end of it. And that's the level that's maybe like, maybe that's more extreme, but many of us miss our lives. And so mindfulness is the invitation not to do that. It's also something we already know and experience. So this is important because, you know, it's not some mystical thing that, you know, only accessible if you're living on a mountaintop or something like that. My, mindfulness is part of what it means to be human. We've all had moments in time where we have felt connected, at ease, present. And for a lot of actors, I hear people tell me that, that when you're immersed in a role, there's a sense of flow and connection and you're just fully present. And probably when you're doing your best work, I'm just speculating here because it's not my field, but when you're doing your best work, you're really in this flow state, right? Or we think about children. You know, children are so, little ones are so in the present moment. I remember when my daughter was little and I would be trying to, you know, take her down the street to get somewhere and she'd want to stop and look at every single bug along the way. And the fact is that we were like that too. 
what happened? You know, we got educated, we went through our lives, our histories, all sorts of things happened, but it's still that I, it's still accessible to us. We haven't lost anything. Mindfulness is an invitation back into something that's part of, as I said, what I think it part of what it means to be a human being. I am going to lead us now in a guided meditation. And I'm looking around. I see, okay, nobody has cameras on. That's okay. It doesn't matter. It's fine. All right. So we're going to, we're going to do the meditation and then we're going to open it up for a little bit more dialogue and there's various things we can do. Um, and even if you've never done it before, well, we will practice it. I'll be guiding you through it. Okay, so let's begin by getting comfortable and finding a posture that works for you. And for most people, just sitting up wherever you are. If you're in a chair or you might be on a couch, some of you might be on a bed, you can sit somewhat upright, that's great. You don't have to if for some reason you have an injury you need to lie down that's okay um, your hands can be resting wherever they're comfortable your eyes can be closed and for some of you you may not want to do that and that's fine just leave them open but try to not distract yourself so you might look have your eyes facing like downward downcast and I also want to say as we do this that the mindfulness meditation is not for everybody. We'll give it a try and some of you may go, oh wow, this really is interesting to me and I really connect with it. And others of you may say, it's not my thing. I don't, I don't care as long as you do something to relieve stress because we need it so badly in this time. But let's give it a try and see what this is like. So so as you settle into your posture somewhat upright back but not too rigid or tight let's notice our feet on the ground feeling your feet on the ground noticing the touch the heaviness pressure might feel vibration or tingling warmth and as you feel your feet connected to the floor you might also maybe notice your body connected to like to the chair you feel the weight of your body on the seat of the chair see if you can connect with the sense of the ground beneath your feet the earth below you even if you're many stories up we can Feel the support of the ground beneath our feet. Feel the solidity. And sometimes when I'm feeling stressed or anxious, I just bring my attention to the connection of my feet to the ground, and it helps me. So you can notice your legs and the weight of your legs on the chair and your back against the chair. There might be sensations of pressure, warmth, heaviness, and so on. Notice your stomach area. Is your stomach tense or tight? See if you can allow it to soften. You can take a deeper breath into that area. Notice your hands, let your hands be soft. You might notice some tingling, warmth, heaviness. Notice your shoulders, letting your shoulders be soft. your throat and face and facial muscles. Let your face be soft. And 
And now let's turn our attention to the sounds around us. Listening to the sounds, the ambient noise in the room you're in or outside the room. Listen to the sounds as if you're listening to your favorite music with openness and curiosity. Often when we hear sounds, we start thinking about them. I wonder what it is. I like, I don't like. See if you can simply listen. For some people, it's quite soothing to listen to sounds. And for other people, it's not. But just see what happens as you listen. And now let's bring our attention into our bodies and see if we can notice our bodies breathing. Can you feel the rising and falling of your abdomen? We're noticing where we feel our breathing. So a lot of people feel it in their abdomen, rising, falling, expanding, contracting. You just want your breath to be at its own natural rhythm in and out through your nose. You don't have to lengthen it or shorten it. Just let it do what it does. Some people notice their breathing at their chest area, rising, falling, expansion, contraction. And for some people, it's the air moving through their nose that they notice, tingling, warmth, coolness. So let's pick something to focus on. We can choose our breath in our abdomen, chest, or nose, or we can continue to listen to the sounds as they come and go. Choose whichever was the clearest or easiest or most compelling. And if you can't decide, they all work equally well, so just pick one. And for this next part of the meditation, we're gonna notice the present moment breath after breath, or sound after sound, in the spot you've chosen, if it's the breath, one breath ends, the next breath begins. And as you do this, you may notice that your attention starts to wander you start thinking about other things, planning, remembering, imagining. If this happens, you're not doing anything wrong. It's completely normal. When you notice your attention has wandered, you can say a soft word in your mind, like thinking, and then gently redirect attention right back to whatever it was you were focusing on. So you're with your breath, you get lost in thought, you notice it, you come back. Other things may happen, just let them be in the background. But if it becomes very obvious to you, then notice it, pay attention to it, like a body sensation or a feeling or a sound. So I'm going to be quiet for about two minutes and you can try it on your own without me guiding.
As we bring the meditation to a close, notice how you're feeling. You might notice how your body feels compared to when you first came in or just how it's feeling now. There might be more relaxation, ease, and if so, enjoy it. Same with your mind. Does your mind feel more relaxed, more present? And if you're not feeling that, if you're feeling something else, see if you can allow whatever is here to be here. There's not something you're supposed to be experiencing, so just get curious about what is present for you. And this is mindfulness. So let's feel our feet on the ground one last time. And then whenever you're ready, you can open your eyes or end the meditation. So thank you for doing that practice with me. And you can just take a moment to reorient yourself, come back. Um, so I love so what I want to do now is um, hear from you how that went and just pop into the chat if you feel like it what happened or if there are any questions and I know there are other questions related to bringing it into daily life or professional questions or let's hold off on those I just want to hear for now what it was like doing the meditation or if you have any questions. Her nice and calming, uh, very relaxed, almost fell asleep. Okay, we'll talk about that. Relaxing. Oh, someone I know from a long time ago. Nice to see your image there. Oh, good. There's a lot of questions coming, so I'll I'll, I'll get to them in a moment. Um, <laughs> Terrell said, it was great. I meditate daily and must say this is the most euphoric meditation I've have had in a while. I'm so glad. I don't, um, you never know. That's one thing about meditating is sometimes you have these really like profound meditations and sometimes they're just like you're antsy and when's it going to end? You never know what's going to happen. Once I came back, I felt more refreshed and energized. Um, heavy feet at the end. Okay, let me get to some of the questions. How long are the meditations <laughs> supposed to last? How long are the medications supposed to last? But I meant meditations. <laughs> um, it really depends. You know, at, we, I'll talk about what, well, I'll talk now about it. Um, I recommend that people, if you're interested in it as a stress reduction tool, and it's a tool of further, deeper inquiry into yourself, that you do it on a regular basis. And so I typically start people out with five minutes a day because everybody has time for five minutes a day. And I'm going to give you a, I'm going to give you a resource at the end, which is an app. We have UCLA mindful app with free meditations on it. And you can start with five minutes and generally work people up to like 10, 15, sometimes 20 minutes a day. It has to be what can fit for your, into your life. Because if you say, okay, I'm going to meditate an hour every day, and then you just set the bar high, you're not going to do it. So um, so it's helpful to try to do it on a daily basis in order to learn the skill, both to have the impact and the benefits of doing it, but also because it, then you can in, use it in your life. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Why do you sit in a chair when meditating rather than sitting on the floor? You no, know, sitting on the floor is totally fine. Most people you know, most people tend to to just be used to chairs. And it, at least in, I teach a lot in the US and that's sort of like a standard that more people are comfortable sitting in chairs, but a lot of people like to meditate on a floor and a cushion. And that's absolutely, I maybe didn't mention it today, but yes, of course, you're welcome to do it. It's not, it's whatever posture is going to be most supportive for you. So, okay, a couple of questions, more questions. Um, oh, someone mentioned being sleepy. Sleepiness is very, very common. <laughs> Just so you know, a lot of people get sleepy when we do this. And probably it's because, let me think, wait, you don't get enough sleep. Am I right? Most people don't get enough sleep. I'm not 
you know, I don't have some magical ability to know that. No, statistically, most people don't get enough sleep. And so when you come to meditation, especially this, maybe this time of day, we're a little tired, my voice is soothing, your eyes are closed, and people can get sleepy. It's, it's absolutely fine. What we learn to do, if we do it on a regular basis, is to practice it at a time of day, you're least likely to get sleepy, right? So maybe when you first get up, some people like to do it when they come home from work or from school. Some people like to do it in the evening, before bed, whatever is going to be most supportive to you. Um, Nancy said, I felt some um, pain in my back and tried to just stay in the present. Yeah. So we didn't have time, but I will say that, I think, as I mentioned earlier, the research around how mindfulness can help chronic pain and general pain, maybe acute pain, chronic pain, is very, very robust. And um, to say briefly, when we're working with pain in our body and we're trying to stay with our breath and then our back is really aching, we can stay with the breath and then kind of gently bring your attention to the pain and open and so just soften to it and breathe into it. And sometimes that can really relax our body and then come back to the breathing so you're not staying with the pain. But the research shows that people who practice mindfulness have learned to both reduce pain symptoms, but also if the pain symptoms aren't reduced, they report more happiness in life like they're able to tolerate the pain better and life gets better in that way. So there's, it's very interesting. There's a lot of tools around that and I don't have time to get into it so much, but it's absolutely helpful. Um, breath and calm, but mind struggling to stay listening to sound. Took a course, listen to Jake, John Kabat-Zinn and I still struggle. Okay. So, um, <sighs> Uh, you don't have to listen to sound. I gave you options. So we started out feeling our feet. Then we went into um, hand, uh, the sounds and then we noticed our breath. I gave that a lot of options because something, no, there's no one size fits all in mindfulness meditation. Different things are going to work for different people. And so for you, Nancy, Nancy Joe, if you, if you found that that's not helpful to do a, um, you know, to listen to the to the sounds, then just don't do it. And but also, it is hard. It's not. I mean, if mindfulness were easy, everybody would do it all the time, right? But people don't people because it takes some work and it takes effort. And what's hard is we try to stay focused, and then our attention wanders, and we come back. But over time, with persistence, it does get easier. I will definitely vouch for that. And I've worked with you know thousands of people over the years. And also, it cultivates more capacity to be with what is. Like, OK, like even me, I've been meditating like 30 years. Sometimes I sit down to meditate, and my mind is wild, thinking about all sorts of things. It's not a problem. It's just what's happening. And so I go, OK, I can be present with that. So. Um, just be easy with yourself on it. Here's a question from Deborah. What about thinking an affirmation or just, or should I just focus on the breathing? I think that's the question. Yeah. So I was going to show you a slide and, um, but I'll just say it. There's hundreds of types of meditations. You can think of meditation as a big category, like sports is a big category. There's hundreds and hundreds of types of sports. Meditation has so many different categories different types of meditation, just like sports. So there are meditations where you think about affirmations. There are meditations where you visualize things. There's healing meditations. There's movement meditation. Some of you may have done transcendental meditation, right? You have a, a, a word you repeat. They're all great. And they, they lead to different things. They have different outcomes, different results. And the main thing is to practice the meditation that you find useful, that you're going to do. That's the only thing you're, I mean, you just have to see which you, do I connect with, which am I finding has results in my daily life? That's like, and what do I mean by results? I'm calmer. I'm more present with my kids. I went for an audition and instead of freaking out, I was able to really be there, be fully present and not worried so much about the future. Um, you know, these are the signs that the meditation is working and is helping you. So, so anyway, my point, Deborah, is um, you can focus on your breathing. Some people use a little bit of a, you said, what about thinking? Oh, no, no. You're, sometimes people use a word like 
rising, falling, or in, out, that helps them stay a little bit more focused. Um, how to quiet the mind. I listen at night and fall asleep. Is there a good time? You know, it's, um, it is definitely, definitely hard to, um, to say like, what's the best time for people? It's, it's very personal, what is going to work for you. And you should experiment if you want to keep going with this. And I'm, like, as I said, I'll give you resources. Where is it going to be most supportive for you? What time of day, what works? You try it out. Someone mentioned older people have trouble sitting on the floor. Yes, that's why I definitely love the option of sitting in a chair. It started off nice, but then I kept thinking about how uncomfortable my body was feeling, neck pain, leg twitching, trying to hold my head in a comfortable position. How do I learn to clear my mind of this? One of the biggest misconceptions about mindfulness meditation is that you're going to have a clear mind, right? Like you're just suddenly all the thoughts are going to disappear doesn't usually happen. What usually happens instead is there are lots of thoughts, but we notice it and then redirect our attention to something neutral like our breathing. And by doing that over and over, that begins to calm the thoughts. And so, um, so it's, it's normal that you were thinking all these things. Oh, this is what's happening here. I'm twitching. How do I hold my head? And at, as you practice, you'll start to feel more comfort, more familiarity, and those thoughts will begin to fade more into the background. And then you just notice it. You can say thinking. No, oh, there's thinking again, thinking, and redirect. Um, Linda liked fo loved focusing on the sound like the music. Usually when I have difficulty falling asleep, every sound drives me crazy. So that approach was eye-opening for me. Yeah, so if you liked the listening meditation, definitely keep going with it. Okay. Do you need to be sitting or can you be laying down? Um, the only difficulty about lying down meditation is it can be conducive to sleep. <laughs> so you just want to support yourself to not fall asleep, but it's absolutely fine, especially if you need it, for instance, because of an injury or um, some kind of reason that your body needs to lie down. Um, I actually like going to the past or the future. Okay, so here's an interesting question. I actually like going to the past, pleasant experiences, or the future, daydreaming about good things. It's my refuge. So I prefer not to be in the moment. Is that bad? Okay, this is such a good question. Remember that research study where I said people reported happiness when they daydream about pleasant things. So let's say you know you you love sushi and you just sit there and you think about sushi. You think and you think it feels great, right? The problem is we our mind doesn't always do that. Our mind will go to pleasant things, but it will go equally to unpleasant things. And you don't have a lot of control. And you probably notice that your mind will perseverate on unpleasant things. So it, you can, you're certainly, there's nothing, that, you know, daydreaming is, is a wonderful thing to do. It, it can lead to creativity, right? We want to, I'm not saying like, okay, you have to be so in the present moment that you never allow your mind to, you know, have enjoyable thoughts. Absolutely not. It's about having, it's about it, how well we can use mindfulness when we need it. When we notice the mind is going into anxious thought, depressed thoughts, angry thoughts, thoughts that are not productive, you know, thoughts, uh, jealousy, comparing, okay, come back to the present moment. When we're thinking about pleasant things, and it can sometimes go awry, like, oh, you're, maybe you're thinking about a part. What if I get that part? That's wonderful. But what happens if you start obsessing and obsessing? Then it's problematic. So let's use the tools when we need it and see what happens. Okay. Couple more questions, and then I'm going to, it looks like we're going to, I'll just keep answering the questions. Um, <laughs> Catherine said, I get dental work done without anesthesia. I meditate through it without attachment to pain. Was inspired by a friend who got nasal surgery without. You know what? Um, I have heard of a number of people who do this. Catherine, and I'm very impressed. I have not tried that. I'm too chicken, but I have heard that it's that a, a lot of people trying it and it is kind of interesting. So good for you. That's great. What's the difference between this meditation and TM? Okay, I mentioned transcendental meditate, transcendental meditation, which is so transcendental meditation involves typically receiving a mantra, 
just a word that you repeat and let's say the word is this is not it but let's say it's om 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 and you repeat this over time and that allows your mind to go to really concentrate and gather and what they say is that over time one reaches states of transcendental states right that's kind of the purpose of the meditation and just to say i'm no expert in it i don't do that meditation mindfulness uses some concentration to help you be present but then also um, it helps you to be aware of whatever is going on so it's not trying to 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 like get so concentrated that everything is blocked out it gives you more awareness of what's happening awareness of self awareness of emotions of bodies of external internal so it's kind of different purposes intended for them in order to mindfulness tends to invite us to learn to be with what is remember i said paying attention to present moment experiences with openness curiosity and a willingness to be with that experience so it really teaches us the capacity to be with life as life is i can be present even when you know, I didn't get the part I wanted. I can't, I, I'm not going to fall apart. I'm going to be with my emotions, offer myself kindness and compassion, take some breaths and stay connected to myself. So mindfulness is, is a tool that's so important. And this is leading to the next question was, isn't mindfulness a broader practice than just meditation? Meaning other practices one does to stay in the moment during the day, even when you can't meditate. Yes, yes, yes. So this is... Um, This is a question about um, what I was just talking about. Mindfulness is both a meditative practice and it's a quality of attention you could have at any moment. So you can, once you start to get the hang of it, you can take it out into your day and use it when you need it. When you're about to yell at your kid, when you um are about to go into an audition so this was one of the questions that someone sent in about um how can i use it when i'm preparing for an audition you can use it significantly to work with your mind the mind that goes into worst case scenarios i'll never get the part the mind that that goes into fear what if i'm not right for this what you know like all of that we can use mindfulness to help us come back into the present moment and just be with ourselves and find a place of ease and peace so when we go into the audition we have uh, we come from a place of strength and not lost in all of our fears i use mindfulness throughout my day I try to bring mindfulness to little things like I like to wash my dishes with mindfulness. That was the example earlier. Um, I bring mindfulness when I'm driving. I I mean, there's lots of ways that you can bring mindfulness. And you have to be careful. You don't close your eyes, obviously, when you're driving. Um, I, I... Okay, so there was a question that I'm sort of answering that question about how to apply mindfulness, specifically preparing for a role in regards to creating a role and developing the character I will say that my expertise is not exactly in how we would use it in the role, except more like I was explaining, how we would work with the mind that gets in the way of our preparation. The part of us that feels unworthy, fearful, all of these can be worked with using mindfulness. And we can we can meditate before we go into to for an audition or before you're um before you're doing some acting job, right? If you meditate and you're more centered and you've kind of let go of the things that are worrying you, you put that to the side, you come in in a very centered way, you're gonna really show up for that role rather than being lost and distracted and potentially, you know, having, it's harder, right? How can we fully show up? So I think there's a lot of ways that mindfulness can be helpful. And you'll see, one of the things I've noticed is People try it, and then once you get the hang of it, you begin to creatively embody it. And that's the thing that I'll encourage you. You will begin to creatively embody what you do. Um, so, so, um, and you'll do it in ways that I won't have any idea about because you know, you know you, and you know your field, and it's it's all very interesting. Um, I did have a question from someone who submitted in advance about wanting to put meditations into um, different uh, 
I think you said something about interstitials within NPR, Pandora, Spotify, Hulu, and that you're wondering how long is ideal. And unfortunately, I don't really know the answer to that question. Um, I'm happy to talk with you offline. You can contact me through the office. If I'll give my information, but I can contact me um, because uh, we, I can maybe think about it with you a little bit more. Okay, so I'm gonna just pull my PowerPoint up. I love your questions. I love, love, love it. I'm gonna pull my PowerPoint up just to give you some resources for leaving from here. So hold on, start with five minutes a day. Talked about many types of meditation, practice, quality of attention. Okay, I didn't talk about that, that's all right. So my center at UCLA, the Mindful Awareness Research Center, teaches mindfulness to the LA community. So we're now global because of the pandemic and we offer most everything online right now, but we will be doing more in person if you happen to be in LA, but I see that all of you are from around the country. We're trying to offer mindfulness through education and research to promote well-being and a more compassionate society. We have public programs every Thursday. So um, I know Janani from um, from I teach every Thursday at the Hammer Museum, and now that is broadcast um, all over. You know, it's it's available to anybody. You can join on Thursdays. But we have maps classes or mindful awareness classes. We train teachers in mindfulness, and we do a number of research studies as well. Um, so I'm going to skip. So we, we have an app. This is what our app looks like, except now it's changed a little bit, but this is our, this is our app. It's called UCLA Mindful. It's, uh, it's downloadable in all the stores. UCLA Mindful app. If you want to just try it with, of course, there are many apps out there and you're obviously welcome to use whatever is out there is useful, but this is one thing. What we also have here that, that's new is a Spanish site so if you didn't speak any english you could join and now all of our basic meditations are translated into 14 different languages including american sign language my, one of my books is called fully present the science art and practice of mindfulness that i wrote with a scientist and my more recent book is the little book of being and then this is the resource for um, our center and how you can reach me through our website uclahealth.org slash mark i'm also going to send a like a handout so you can follow up so you'll have some of the resources for you for you so i think that's it um it's been really wonderful to be um to be with all of you hi anna maria so great to see your name and you she was in the teacher training program so awesome um really really grateful for your time and i do hope it's helpful and please take this with you and use it as much as you can um and i wish you all the best <laughs>